All right. So uh, going into uh, File Explorer, last uh, last week we created a file that was Assembly One. Uh, the virtual component was tied to it. That wasn't really my desired file name. If I just go into Windows and <coughs> rename that uh, that file, I'm going to lose the internal references, the external references that say this file is tied to to this uh, to this other file. Uh, so let's see. Let's go down to the. Um, We'll get down to the projects and get to assembly one. And so this is going to allow me to do uh, quite a few things. Uh, it's going to give me the list. It's not laid out the same as the Windows Explorer, so it's not really a copy and paste, cut and paste. It'll do some basic uh, movement. It will copy folders and, and let you make duplicates. Uh, but really, it's, it's more along the lines of things that are specific to SolidWorks. Um, so again, I downloaded this from the SolidWorks website. This was one of the free downloads because it, it doesn't seem to install with the education version. The commercial version it installs automatically and this is part of the PDM works going through and doing your document management. All right, so if you install a vault and go through the process of checking things in, checking things out, uh, this will be the interface at the basic version. All right, so. I need to, uh, to rename this. So on this side, we're looking at the, the file structure. This is going to read the majority of file types. There's only been a few file types that this is choked on, hasn't, hasn't been able to do anything with. All right, so if I look at a picture, it's going to show me the picture. If I look at the, the PNG, it's going, to, you know, it's going to give me my images. Mainly, what I'm, what I'm looking for is on the assembly side, if I look at properties, and I, I have a list of my properties set up for the title block. I can go ahead and, and come into this and very quickly make changes. Um, so we changed materials on all of these, or uh, I need to update the part number to have another extension, or my rev levels, or something like that. Um, very quickly, I can come through this and identify all of those SolidWorks files, look at their properties, and make an adjustment right in this window, and it will go back to the SolidWorks file. Otherwise, I have to be in SolidWorks, open up the part, go to File, go to Properties, identify what it is that I'm going to going to make the change to, make the change, save it, close it, and you know, and it's, it's this longer process. All right, so this is going to be a uh, a quicker utility. Uh, references will show me what is linked to, or what the uh, the ref you know just what it says uh, internal external references. So internal to the assembly, the liquid uh, assembly was the one that I was concerned about, right? Because it's this virtual component, and if I rename it assembly one, I'm going to end up with some question marks or some explanation points that say this is no longer tied to that name, All right? So I want to uh, go through and uh, rename, and this is going to give me the list. So if I've copied and reused this quite a bit, I may have a lot of residual references that I'm not aware of. I use this in another project and I bring it over into my new project and I want to reuse it with some modifications. It may retain those those links back to paths even though they're not necessarily current. Okay. And uh, it's in red text indicates that uh, um, I think just mainly the internal to the assembly. It's not a. Okay, so um, it's, 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 it's not an individual part. I'm. I haven't seen that before, so I'm guessing. Okay. <laughs> That's my best guess. That, that, that was a warning or something or something. Is yeah, it's identifying it as there's something special going on. Okay. Um, at least that's the way I'm taking it. And then the where used, uh, what it's. Um, uh, well, since it didn't give me anything, obviously I haven't made any drawings or anything else with it. Uh, the configurations list. Uh, default in, le in use, if I had uh, created configurations for this, I would see the list of configurations and have uh, some idea. We haven't in included any internet hyperlinks, but the important one, uh, if eDrawings was installed correctly, I would have the ability to rotate, zoom, view, do all of the eDrawing functions out of this window directly. All right, so I need to find out what's going on with the eDrawing side of things to, to, make, that, uh, to make that click. All right, so uh, the uh, it's kind of hanging on me there. So let's how about jump over to another one? Repairing the installation. How about just getting it back? Okay, I may have uh, be locked up and crashed. 
All right, and try the close window. Ah, yeah, close the window. So I'll relaunch it. Let it uh, go, let it go through its startup. All right. So uh, with the e drawings, we should be able to to view my my intention or what I'm what I'm going to do then real quick is just go through the um, the uh, the assembly. When I click on the assembly, I get I open a document. It will launch SolidWorks. It will open the document in SolidWorks directly from this interface. Pack and go. So instead of being inside of SolidWorks, it'll go directly to Pack and Go. I can zip these up. I can gather up the files from multiple locations and put them in one folder. All right. So Pack and Go is a useful utility. Uh, my rename, rename in this case is going to go through, and it's going to be able to see all of those references that we we're looking at over on the third tab, and it's going to update them as well. And that's the difference between Windows Explorer and SolidWorks File Explorer. SolidWorks can manage those references without breaking the links. All right, and so in this case, uh, let's go ahead and click on it. I will tell it to rename. It gives me an interface, and it's going to go through and search. It's going to find uh, what we name this. So um, we'll just go with the generic bottle assembly. And when I hit OK, uh, let's go ahead and do including uh, the virtual components. I know I have a virtual component, the liquid. It already told me it was an internal uh, assembly, so uh, that component is included. It goes through and finds it. And now when I open up that, uh, that assembly, I shouldn't have any errors popping up telling me that something bad's happening or uh, you know, can't, can't reestablish the link. All right. Within the, the list then, if I go down through, then these are going to give me the little flyaways to, to show me all of the pieces and kind of get me started. Once I'm done, I can kind of just scrunch it up, put it up in the corner out of my way, and use it next time. On the day-to-day -day work PC desktop, I have it launch that automatically on startup. It takes you know 10 or 15 seconds sometimes, but it's running in the background and it's accessible. Uh, we'll say the uh, the commercial version that it, when it installs with SolidWorks commercial is it is tied to PDM and we need to go into the uh, the settings for that program and tell it not to launch PDM unless you have it active. All right. So, all right. Um, okay. So you know, it gives you kind of a, a quick quick look at the um, the SolidWorks File Explorer. Um, and uh, any questions on on that one? Okay, so last week I mentioned we went through and we generated the loft. The loft worked on that example because of the narrowness and the, uh, the curvature of my, my surface. This was the previous version. And uh, so this was the, the first incarnation. And notice that this has a little bit more of the uh, curve or the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the standard, standard bottle will have that little bit of a divot. This was the ruled surface that I was trying to generate. So I wanted to come back and just revisit this very quickly and, and show you how this was generated as opposed to the loft. Remember, I wasn't real happy with the, the loft, and we're going to see that one again. And I may want to be able to go in and, and do the correction. So the difference between bottle one and bottle two is that this curvature is kind of pointing out that way. If I come off tangent to that curve, I'm going to kind of go out this way where the other one was, was almost vertical or was vertical. All right, the difference that that makes is that I can come back to my ruled surface and we wait for the computer to catch up, there we go. I can come back and look at this from a ruled surface and end up with my sort of clover leaf shape. And the ruled surface comes in and comes off of that and goes up at the tangent angle. All right, so where the other one would have come up vertical and not really intersected the cylinder, um, this one comes up at a little bit of an angle, and when that comes, uh, the cylinder comes down, it is intersecting it enough that I can do the trim, and I get that little bit of a, um, you know, that little bit of a, a, a better contour. The trim then, uh, on the downside of this technique, is that at each of these intersections, without going through and doing some, some basic cleanup and uh, manipulation of, the, um, uh, of the, the generating surface, each of these, I believe, is where the gaps are generated. 
So I end up with five gaps. And that is only, only a problem on the NIT. The NIT finds it and tries to correct for it. All right, so going back through this, uh, did the same, same basic processes. Get this down here. Put the, uh, the fill on the top of the cap. This one would not take the thicken, so it got the surface knit. And we want to look at the surface knit because it's going to show me those gap locations. All right, so same thing. We pick our, <coughs> our surfaces that we're interested in. Uh, we tell it to try to form the solid, merge the entities. But then it identifies these gaps. And these gaps are mm -hmm. a little less than 2 tenths of a thousandth, but they're there. All right, and our condition to knit this and make it a solid is this is watertight. So the software needs to know what to do with those minuscule little little gaps. So by checking those and identifying those uh, items, we're telling it, go ahead and, and uh, patch those, fill those, do whatever you need to do to be able to complete this process. All right, so in the process of doing the surface, this is a fairly common occurrence that my intersections don't quite intersect all the way or completely. I'm going to let the software go back and pick up the gaps. All right, and then the last one was just to go ahead and shell it, and and that in this case ended up with where we we started, kind of left where we where, where we left off last time. Yeah. On the sh on the shelling there, you're talking about, <coughs> the neck is the top part is a little thicker. Yeah. And it, at the at the bottom of the straight part, it, it tapers out and it gets thinner. Yeah. And down at the bottom, it gets thicker. It is are you doing that there? No. So but the shell is the, the preferred tool to do that with. Okay, but can you change that from a it, thick part to a you know, tapered thinner part? Okay. Yeah, the, the shell is going to be able to, to make the multi-thickness parts. On the second, uh, second option, multi-thickness settings, you're going to pick the face and you're going to give it a value. Okay. All right, so... I think it goes down to what, like the 32nd or so, the thinnest part of the bottle? Without without measuring it and going through, and it'll transition really nice. Each, I know you yeah, we'll try to do the transition as I know you yeah. Chose yeah. The top part for it as, as an eighth of an inch or something like that, yeah. and then it, you know that's not true. But then it goes down. Yeah. Let's the tape where it starts getting thinner. No, uh, that wouldn't happen. And then it starts all the way down. It the will. Bottom, it's getting thicker. If as long as it can calculate the intersections, it will do it. Okay. If uh, if it starts popping up errors. It's because the transitions are more than it can take. And in that case, I would say go ahead and shell it all the same thickness and then deal with those individual areas as um, move, moving faces or modifying the faces directly. Okay, so let me kick this one out. Um, that was just the, um, the example of the, the ruled surface uh, being able to pull up at the tangent. And it gave me slightly different geometry. So when we go back and we pull up um, the second um, second bottle. Get back to this one. So in this case, if we needed to to thicken this area, ah, browse for file. So there's my bottle. All right. So what that just did is it it made the made the transition. It made the link but it didn't carry all the way over completely to the file. If I hadn't done the rename in, in uh, the SOLIDWORKS ex, uh, Explorer, it would have aired out there and said, can't find the leak, it's not a, a valid link. So this one completed the link. Ah, it's still showing me the question mark though. How about a rebuild? Okay, now I'm nervous. <laughs> all right, we'll see what it did. Oh, that one's still assembly one. I named it on, I changed it on the other one. Oh, that's nice. Okay, well, uh, I did it for bottle one, not for bottle two, so apologies. We're going to still be with assembly one until I can come back to this one. All right, so in this case, if uh, we want to want to thicken those up, we're going to be in the part, and I would probably be picking on the internals of that face and maybe the uh, the radius. And under the direct editing, if I move the face, I could give um, I could give that face ten thousandths more, or whatever, ten thousandths plus, and it would add that material to to the uh, to the cylinder, and also try to blend it back to the internal fillet. Well, we'll go ahead and see what it does. You didn't actually select the um, 
to fill it with a radius. Of no, I want to see what it. Um, yeah. If it's gonna, if it's gonna like it, or I already seeing the error box, it's just having to think what it's gonna tell me. <laughs> All right. Okay, those make me really nervous when it takes that long to. Okay, failed to move faces, and it is probably gonna be back blending into the, the radius, but that's gonna be one of the tools that I would go to and find out if it's gonna work. Uh, the other thing we do is, is simplify this geometry, build up the neck, uh, since the neck was built up first before, um, before I put the, um, uh, the threads on. Uh, let's see, we have the shell, we put the, the threads on, and then the other issue is going to be these dimples. There's a lot of curvature in there that it has to calculate. That's just really complex geometry. All right, and there may be there, there may just be uh, come a time where since this is going to go into the uh, to the blow mold, we know that those are going to thicken up. That it's going to be the controlling of the process that's going to determine those thicknesses, not anything we do in the model. We're generating the outside mold, and it is uh, temperatures and plastic and you know uh, material selection, all those that are going to. Could that be it where it thins up on the on the middle part of the bottle? <coughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, it's going to have. Yeah, everything's going to going to shrink. Um, we're going to we're going to build in uh, some some manner of shrink, and then it has to be able to come out of the mold. So it, it is going to is forced against the side. It, it, yeah. It's going to move some certain amount of material up into where those ripples are. Yeah. yeah. And a certain amount below to that feature. It may I think just pretty much all injection molds are they have different thickness. But this is an injection molding. Well, blow mold. Just blow molding. Blow mold. So what happens if a, a, a a cylinder of soft material drops down between two sides, it slams mm -hmm. shut and it blows air into it. Yeah, it yeah, would it up. be a little uh, increased temperature in the middle that would work or not work? Mm -hmm. And then higher. Not, not my field. We'd have to ask the not, mold right. guys. <laughs> yeah, and I guess the real question is in terms of bottles, that kind of thing, where, where would it be particularly critical to have that? Have that information. Well, of course, it at the top and the bottom is going to be thicker because you know they, they don't want them to be uh, punctured or more. There's another shape that actually gets put in the mold, so that's dictated by that shape. They look like test tubes. Mm -hmm. They get dropped in. It's called a parison. It's actually melted. It's the actual plastic. It's this, this opened end that it slides right out of a injector you follow this by right? They actually have the neck already built in. Right. We should yeah. jump into YouTube and do a search for blue molding and we'll, yeah. we'll have the complete process there for us. And all that stuff is in the mold when it shuts. Yeah. It caps off and blows there. And okay, so moving on to the cap. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, but really we need to, to look at the YouTube and see how they do it. Uh, um, I've seen the uh, the big machines pump out the milk jugs, uh, you know, a thousand a minute or a couple, you know, a couple hundred a minute, and you never really get to see everything's happening so fast. You never really get to see what's going on uh, internally. So, all right. So getting into this, uh, we we alluded to with the liquid, calculating our volume, kind of a, a top down uh, version, and I want to um, uh, go ahead and do the uh, bottle cap. I include the bottle cap as, as also a top-down.